Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. How you on? Good to see you all here this morning. We want to welcome Brother Tom and his lovely wife, Sister Kathy. We thank you so much for being here, sir. We look forward to hearing you preach later on. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, this morning, before we begin, you know, we still have a, a number of people that's uh, fighting the COVID. Let's remember uh, Mr. and Ms. Robinson. Uh, I understand they had that infusion, is that what they call it? And uh, <clears throat> hadn't kicked in yet, so, you know, it sounds like they're, they're pretty ill. So let's remember them. And I noticed Brother Mars is back with us this morning. He's back teaching Sunday school, so that's good to see. Uh, their household coming along and, and getting back on track, and, and thank God for it. Well, as we open this morning, Brother Mike, would you open prayer? <clears throat> Yes, Lord, help me. Help me. Yes. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. And don't say, oh, he's finally leaving Mark chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, because I'm not. Uh, I'm going to head back over there in just a moment. But I wanted to, I got caught up this, this week in what I wanted to speak of from, from that miracle or the preceding events to that miracle in Mark chapter 6. And I got caught up in a little truth right here, and I just kind of wanted to lay it out there to... Uh, kind of lay a foundation and make us have even more of an appreciation of our blessed Lord, of what we see him doing with this multitude. And uh, the praise God for it. But <clears throat> might the Lord add to bless, uh, maybe he bless the reading of his word. And, and in doing so, as I said, I pray that he'll attune our hearts to properly view the compassionate actions of our Lord that we see here in Mark chapter 6. Here in Genesis chapter 22, we're all very familiar with the story. Of course, therein is the offering up of Isaac by his father Abraham. And I'll just kind of skim down and hit a few verses of it. But you might recall that God said to Abraham there in verse 2, He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And so we see in the text here that Abraham, he rose up early the next morning. Uh, notice there, I thought it wasn't any, well, I'll think about it or I need to pray about it. It says, no, he rose up early the next morning and, and he gathered up what was needed, took a couple of the young men and Isaac, and he headed off to that place that God had instructed him to go to. And, and with the intent to do as he had been instructed, and it says that on the third day, Abram, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. He told the two young men to wait here and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. That was in verse 5. Now after they had separated from the young men, Isaac said to Abraham, his daddy, he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And in verse 8, Abraham said, of my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And you know the story that when they got there, Abraham, he prepared the altar. He bound up Isaac. He laid him up on that wood. And just as he was getting ready to kill him, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou has not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. 
And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. I had a little note here that's really not related to this lesson, but it really caught my attention. Uh, <clears throat> many students of the scriptures uh, believe that this Mount Moriah is on the same mountain where our blessed Lord was sacrificed, Golgotha. Now there's some disagreement on it, but uh, the, the Lord of order and perfection that our God is, I thought, well, how, how fitting. That's just a little side note. But if you would, turn over to Mark chapter 6. Now you might be wondering, well, what does Genesis chapter 22 have to do with Jesus stand, standing up before this multitude in Mark chapter 6? And the answer is this. The main thing I wanted to lead you to in relation to our text here is found in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 22 that I just read to you. And it said, And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. And that word means the Lord will see to it. Or as we might say, the Lord will provide. Now, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, he is the incarnate Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And as we read this text in Mark, we see Jesus as the provider. And not only do we see him as, just as the provider, we see the motivation behind his provision. And we see in that his compassion and his mercy towards this multitude. You know, we think of such an awesome God and how omnipotent that he is, unlimited power, unlimited knowledge, and he is our provider, but yet he is compassionate. And that is just a wonderful truth. And we see that set forth right here in this text in the person of our Lord. And we'll read through this again. Of course, we've read it multiple times over the past few weeks, and I, I, I keep uh, coming up on something and pick up a little nugget and begin looking at it and I, I kind of just get stuck there but that's just the way it is and that's the way I'm going to keep doing but look down in Mark chapter 6 verse 32 it says and they departed into a desert place by ship privately and the people saw them departing and many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all cities and out went them and came together unto him and Jesus when he had came out saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, Well, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. You might remember last week we noted that... <clears throat> There was also women and children there with them. Realistically, that could have been around 20,000 people. I borrowed a quote from Brother Tom's book concerning this passage right here in the devotional writings of Tom Hayes. And I thought it's coincidental that he was here, but yes, I had already read this. But in his introduction to this miracle, Brother Tom wonderfully summarized the story. And he says, while there are many helpful lessons in this account, we're basically confronted with the sufficient sufficiency of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, sir. You know, he is set forth as being more than enough for us. In our insufficiency, Christ is our sufficiency. 
And certainly in this text here, we see the sufficiency of Christ as having no limit, the Creator creating that food. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul wrote, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And of course, I've said each week about this text, it's a very familiar, well-known experience in the life of our Lord and, and one that any of us that's ever been in Sunday school or church, you know, we've heard this preached and taught. Uh, many of us have been familiar with the story ever since we were just toddlers. Our blessed Lord feeding this multitude with two fish and five loaves. And a few minutes ago, we looked at that meaning of Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide and in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, of course, we see the deity of Christ, the Creator, and the Lord of all things providing what men need. And He not only has the ability to provide, but He also he has the desire to provide what we need. And there's four provisions that's mentioned here in this little text, <clears throat> beginning in verse 30 and going through verse 44. And we seem not only is he the provider, but he is a compassionate provider. And that's really what I want to uh, stress on this morning. You might remember the provisions. You have already talked about the provision of rest that he gives us in verses 30 through 32. Today we're going to talk about this provision of truth. It says that he taught them many things down in verse 34. Over in Matthew, Matthew speaks of the provision of healing during this text here that he healed. And then, of course, we see the provision of food. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at that provision of rest that our Lord provides for the weary soul. You might recall that Jesus said to him, he said, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. We spent much time looking at that. And Jesus knows what we have need of. He knows that we need physical rest. He knows that we need a spiritual rest. And we saw from the scriptures that Jesus, though he was God in the flesh, he had a need of both. You know, he wasn't a fleshly body just, uh, just as we are. He, he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands. You know, he, he slept and he frequently he hungered and he came apart to spend time with his heavenly father. And he understands. He knows the needs of his children to come apart for this physical rest and more importantly to come apart for that spirit, uh, for that, uh, uh spiritual rest and a refreshment to be alone with him. And we saw that that word come indicated that it's spoken of in the imperative sense. This is, wasn't just a suggestion to him. It was a command, come ye apart. He knows the importance of it. Luke chapter 9 verse 10 related to this, it says, and he took them and went aside privately into a desert place. You know, it's, it's important that we come apart and we spend time with our Lord privately. And again, we spent much time on that. Uh, if we don't do so, then we're running on empty. You might remember I quoted uh, Brother Vance Havener that he said, if we don't come apart, then we will come apart. And it's so important that we come apart and be with our blessed Lord. And last week, I even added another comment to this, that the only route to true holiness is through occupation with Jesus. You know, coming apart, spending time with him personally, that is the route to true holiness. Uh, many times, so many folks, and maybe we've been there too, you know, the, the idea of holiness is some mental checklist of do's and don'ts, things I can do, things I can't do. And that's all rooted in man's wisdom and man's uh, reasoning rather than God's word, or so much of it is. But, if, you know, if, if we get up close to him, he'll begin to work on our insides on what's in here. And we won't need that spiritual checklist because he'll be the one that's governing our actions and it'll be happening from the inside out. And, you know, Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, I refer to this a lot, but it says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man. These are the words of Christ. He said, But that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. And then he added in verse 18, he said, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile a man. That's why the Lord sees that it's so important that we get alone with him and spend much time with Jesus. Come ye apart into a desolate or a desert place, just simply meaning alone and private. That, that's so important for us. Only occupation with him will clean up what's on the inside of us. 
to be occupied with Jesus will take care of our deficiencies and, and the problems that we have. You know, the more we're occupied with him, the more we're going to be like him. Uh, we'll increase and get this. Self will decrease. We'll talk about that old self again in a moment. So we see this first provision, this provision of rest that's given by the hand of the incarnate Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. <clears throat> Next in verse 34, that's where I'm going to spend the rest of the morning. We see this provision of truth at the end of that verse 34. And it tells us that, and he began to teach them many things. And we'll see in this verse that not only is Jesus the provider, but again that he is a compassionate provider. And it's a, it's, it has a significance to it. My wife Janice asked me sometime during the past week, well, how was my lesson coming, and which she frequently does. And, and I replied, I said, well, I planned to go all the way to the end of this text, but I, I hadn't got past the first verse I got to there in verse 34. And, uh, you know, it, it's, there's just so many truths wrapped up here, and I don't want to run roughshod over them. Uh, it seems that I, I've, I've been moving at a snail's pace, but, you know, as, as long as God continues to take his word and to bless it, to break it, to just, and, and to distribute it among us and allow me to be a part of it, I want, I want to be a part of it. I want to go at his pace. And I don't want to pass up on these, these good thoughts here. Just in the last couple of days, I was reading the thoughts of some old saint of God, and I can't even remember, remember who it was long ago he passed on into glory. And I was reminded of why we get hung up on verses such as verse 34. You know, and to paraphrase the words of this preacher, he said it's not as important the people hear about us and our experiences or the facts in history that are set forth in the scriptures. Now these things are important, certainly, but they're not the most important. The most important thing people need to hear and experience is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ being presented, being set forth before them. And that's what God blesses. That's where he wants to lead us to in his word. Exposing the person of Christ, and especially right here, exposing the person of Christ as a compassionate provider. Mark 6, 34 again, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. You might recall that Jesus had taken the twelve across the Sea of Galilee for the purpose of rest. But we're told that when he came forth or he came out that he saw much people. Jesus and the twelve, they had traversed across the north edge of the sea to this remote area near this village of Bethsaida. Luke chapter 9 verse 10 refers to the location as a desert place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. It was right nearby. And there was this great multitude that had made their way around the shoreline, arriving there before that they got there, before Jesus and the twelve. And, of course, Jesus, knowing all things, <clears throat> when he come forth and seen them, uh, he knew their motivation. He knew why they had followed him to the other side. John gives a reason for their following in uh, the same account, John chapter 6, verse 2. It tells us, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus knew that. He knew why they were there. And certainly there were folks in the crowd that were in need of healing and deliverance from demons. But you know, the majority of them, they were just fascinated with seeing him perform these miracles. You know, his name had spread abroad. He was famous, and they were fascinated with it. And you would think that their uh, materialism, their superficiality, their shallowness, and just that plain old human nature would have irritated our Lord, but uh, it didn't. You'd think that the intrusion and the interruption of Jesus and the interruption of Jesus and the twelve's downtime, they went there seeking rest. You'd think that would have led to a, a not-so-hospitable uh, welcome or maybe even a, a little aggravation you know, towards that crowd. Matter of fact, the four gospel accounts of this do indicate that uh, perhaps the disciples, they were a little bit annoyed about the whole thing, but not our blessed Lord. You might recall a few weeks ago, old Herod Antipas, when we were speaking to him from a few weeks back, Remember, he desired to see Jesus perform some miracle. Same motivation. 
And, and when he finally got to meet Jesus, Herod was glad and he questioned him with many questions, but we was told in the text, but Jesus answered him nothing. You remember the theme of that lesson was that Jesus had cut, I mean, that Herod had cut off the voice of God, killing John the Baptist. Um, but in this instance, it wasn't like that. He knew why they had come. He knew their shallow motivation. He knew their insufficiency. But yet in Luke chapter 9, verse 11, it says he received them, meaning that he welcomed them. When he stepped forth, he welcomed them. The fact that he received or he welcomed them, that wasn't a put on. It wasn't like they're being inconvenienced by unsuspected or unexpected guests showing up at their door. You know, at a bad time, you know, we might put on a smile and be cordial, but it's not real. Now, certainly nobody in here has ever had to react like that, but it, 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 <laughs> it does happen from time to time. Uh, that wasn't the case with Jesus. You know, the text in Mark states, and Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion. You know, that word compassion, it's interesting. Oh, it's an interesting word. And understanding the meaning and the use of it, it gives us great insight into the person of Jesus, who he was, what was going on on the inside of him. Uh, it, it ought to also cause us, uh, you know, to lean towards a kind of a self-examination or a self-evaluation of maybe how frequently or how infrequently that we really experience compassion as it's stated forth right here in the sense that it's used. The words found in uh, <clears throat> Strong's Concordance, the number of the Greek words 4697, and no, I'm not going to even try to pronounce it because it's about that long, and I'll splatter that all over the place. But the word, it makes reference to our internal organs. It means to have the bowels yearn. Get what he's saying? It means to be moved in the inward parts, what we might speak of as being gut-wrenching. You know, some compassion is the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress coupled together with a desire to alleviate it. It's more than just feeling sorry for somebody. You know, the verb form of the word expresses an outward flow of one's life in contrast to our natural tendency towards being self-centered. True compassion, and that was the person of our Lord Jesus. You know, we've probably, uh, we've all been there. We've experienced extreme pity for someone to the point that, you know, that we was all twisted up on the insides. We hurt. We felt that. We've been there. And, and if we have, most likely it was associated with somebody that was very close to us. But that's not the case with Jesus, right? what we see right here. He came forth and looked out upon this multitude, this whole big multitude, and he was moved with compassion towards them. He felt the pain where we feel pain and anxiety. Think of the compassion that's wrapped up in the truth of the cross. Oh, me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you'll notice on down a couple of verses in the text that we read from Mark, there's a contrast of self-centeredness, of the self-centeredness of the nature of man versus the compassion. And that's between the disciples and Jesus. You know, what we just read, when supper time came, the disciples, they said, send them away someplace else. You know, pretty much they're saying, we don't want to have to deal with this. Send them away someplace else. Let them worry about feeding themselves. But Jesus' reply was, give ye them to eat. And he said, you know, he set them out on that mission. You feed them. But verse 34 not only tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. That's a glorious and wonderful thought. But it goes into more detail and it tells us why he was moved with compassion. And the reason being, the why was that he saw them as sheep not having a shepherd. That's a very serious thing to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was seen through the eyes of the great shepherd. Sheep having no shepherd, they're not going to make it long. They, they're in dire straits. They're in a, that's a real problem to not have a shepherd. Sheep require a constant guide and care. They need guidance for food, for water, for protection. There are many perils involved in being a sheep and especially in being a sheep with no shepherd. <clears throat> There's an author by the name of Douglas McMillan. A while back, Brother Jack gave me a book of his titled The Lord Our Shepherd. 
And I highly recommend that for reading. It's not a, it's easy reading. It's not a very long book, less than a hundred pages. But every time since reading, and I've read it multiple times, but when I come across something about a sheep in the Bible, I always go back to what the brother had to say about the sheep. He gives a wonderful insight into the nature and the personality. And yes, sheep, according to him, they have a personality. And the shepherd, he learns that personality. And he speaks of the, uh, and the needs of the sheep along with the role of the shepherd and the relationship between the two. Now, Mr. McMillan, or Brother McMillan, he grew up uh, the son of a shepherd. And he was a shepherd himself for 12 or 14 years prior to God calling him to preach. And his book, The Lord Our Shepherd, is from a series of sermons that he preached on the 23rd Psalm there in Scotland. And uh, this, I said all that to get to this one quote he had, and it's so true as we look at our blessed Lord. But Macmillan said, One of the things which is fundamental to the whole business and profession of a shepherd is this. Enough passion to see that his sheep will have all that they need and enough sense to see that they will not get what will harm or destroy them. That is that is wonderful. That is a wonderful truth. When Jesus looked out on that multitude and saw them as sheep not having a shepherd, um, he was moved with compassion. He wasn't looking at the physical, but rather he was looking at the spiritual aspect of it. They were sheep that had no one to lead them on the path of true, real, eternal life, and he recognized that. They were people just trying to make it on their own, just make their way through the through the world. They were helpless, they were pitiful, and they were in great danger. And the saddest part of all of it was that they weren't aware of that pitiful condition. And Jesus knew that too, that they, they didn't know any better. Just sheep wandering around. You know, it's people all around us, <clears throat> just like those in this multitude, sheep wandering aimlessly without a shepherd. You know, they're from the entire spectrum or range of humanity, you know, from the one lying in the gutter to the ones very successful in the secular realm. And maybe even those that are wandering around in a religious world. There are those out there too. There are sheep having no shepherd. And, and the one thing they all have in common is they have all expended or in the process of expending all of the resources, everything they have, laboring for the meat which perishes rather than laboring for that meat which is endureth unto everlasting life. And that's what Jesus saw when he looked out on that multitude. That's what he saw when he looked at you and me. He looked at us in our sin and in our pity that he felt compassion towards, revealed ourselves to it. Here next week, or I guess sometime next week, I'm going to get to him walking on the water. And the whole purpose of that, to reveal who he really was to the men in that boat because he was going to use them in such a powerful way. I kind of let it out the bag now. But, but one of Brother McMillan's references to the dangers facing a sheep was their tendency to try to get to a little patch of green grass down on the side of a cliff. Now think about this. It made such an impact on me as how it applies to life. And he shepherded it there in Scotland where there was a lot of steep terrain, had a lot of cliffs and, and bluffs, beautiful countryside. Uh, that's where my ancestors come from. I've never been there, but it, I can tell some of it's in me, you know. But it, he said the sheep would spy a little patch of green grass uh, uh, down on one of those bluffs. And they'd try to make their way to it. And what a picture of worldly desire, spending all our resources. Yeah, what a picture of that. And many times if they made it, they had overeat when they got to it. They would overeat, they'd lay down, and then they couldn't get up. And, and they would die there if the shepherd didn't find them. And, and, and sometimes they even would fall to their death trying to make their way down to what they seen down there that they wanted to go get, and it would kill them. You know, they'd never come back from it. Jesus, looking out upon that multitude, he saw the sheep in danger of falling off of the cliff into a Christless eternity. That's what he looked upon when he saw them. I'll never forget Brother Art. I heard him say, I asked him, Brother Art, he loved football, big football player and all that stuff. So why don't you go to football games anymore? And I think with his grandson, he did somewhat. He said, as I've, as I've gotten older, he said, I just can't bear to look around at those young people and look at that multitude and think that most of them's going to drop off into hell. 
He said that just tore him up and it took the joy out of him being there. But Jesus was moved with compassion towards these people. And, and he yearned on his inward parts or in his inward parts. And we see the result of his compassion. We see in that the second provision of the incarnate Jehovah Jireh that the Lord will provide. And our text says down there in verse 34, and it says, And he began to teach them many things. And what did he teach? Luke chapter 9 verse 10 says that he spake unto them of the kingdom of God. Might God help us that we never take for granted the speaking forth of the Word of God. You know, that in itself is an act, it's an act of kindness, mercy, and an act of grace flowing from the provisional hand of Almighty God. Jesus was not just a teacher come from God as Nicodemus had perceived when he spoke to him in John chapter 3, but he was God come to teach. And here he was before this multitude speaking the truth of the word of God, and he spake unto them the kingdom of God. That's universal grace right there. I mean, the word was going out to all of them. Such a privilege to sit under, to hear it. You might remember that Ethiopian. That was universal. How about on a personal level, that Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Remember, he was returning from worshiping there in Jerusalem, and he was sitting in his chariot reading from Isaiah, and the Spirit directed Philip, He said, go near and join thyself to this chariot. That's in Acts chapter 8, verse 29. And Philip did so, and he heard he heard the eunuch, and he heard him reading from Isaiah 53, verses 7 through 8. And Philip asked him, he said, understand thou what thou readest? Understandeth what thou readest? And the eunuch replied, how can I except some man guide me? What a wonderful truth that we get to hear the word of God. Brother Jack, I think every time I see him, he wants to remind me, he said, the son, he said, God uses men to teach men. And what a, what a wonderful and glorious truth that is. Jesus was in the process of teaching the greatest preachers that it was going to ever be. You know, right here. He was teaching them. Now keep in mind here that Philip's not just some man, but rather he is a God-sent man. Verse 35 on that text tells us, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You know, it's the outflowing of compassion from our blessed Lord Jesus Christ that we're privileged to read and to hear the word of God preached and taught. You might recall, I'm about done here, but in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. My closing thought comes from a message preached by Alexander McLaren. I ain't dropping all these names to try to impress you or anything. I just don't want to take credit for the man's work. It, it, It blessed me to read this. But it was a sermon titled, The World's Bread. And he said, when Jesus looked out on that multitude, he saw deeply into their condition, and pity welled in his heart. If we looked on the crowds in our great cities with Christ's eyes, their spiritual state would be the most prominent thing in sight. And if we saw that as he saw it, disgust, condemnation, indifference would not be uppermost, as they too often are. But some drop of his great compassion would trickle into our hearts. The masses are still as sheep without a shepherd, ignorant of the way and defenseless against their worst foes. Do we habitually try to cultivate as ours Christ's way of looking at men and Christ's emotions towards men? If we do, we shall imitate Christ's action for men and recognize that to reproduce as well as we can the many things which he taught them is the best contribution which his disciples can make to healing the misery of a world without Christ. And I'm going to close with that thought right there. I hope I've said something that God's 
been able to use to be a help to you. And you know, the only way we can get to that state goes back to that first provision, that provision of rest, getting alone with the Lord, just being consumed by him, being caught up in him, letting him work in us. That's the only way we can actually have eyes that will see the multitudes as Christ saw. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. It's a blessing being able to stand up here and, and to speak. Brother Ralph, would you close with prayer, please, sir? Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family, and I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Praise the Lord.